Good morning. I'm Deb Sullivan Trainer. I'm the well, Vice President and Dean so of the College of Arts and Sciences. And I'd like to welcome you to Prime Time, which today is a presentation of some of the Ed Grid Scholars done by faculty and um, student in the nursing department. This is our um, last prime time of the semester. Prime time is a collaboration between Friends of the Library, the Bethel Library, Faculty Development, and other offices. And it's a chance for us to hear what, uh, what faculty and students are thinking and doing and learning. Um, be sure to check out the library news and events um, webpage and you can see what we will have coming up in the spring. And also, if there's somebody that you know that couldn't get here today, these are recorded, as you can see and they're available on the, on the website. Uh, the Edwin Scholars Program um, supports faculty and student research as they collaborate on a research project. This project must be one that has the potential to make a significant contribution to a given field of study, and the project must reflect meaningful collaboration on research between students and faculty. The Edwin Scholars Program is named after John Alexis Edwin, the founder of what is now Bethel University. One of the key educational principles that Edwin articulated in the 19th century was that the relation between teacher and pupil shall not be that of commander and subject, but one of true friendship and helpfulness. It is in this spirit that we established the Edwin Scholars Program. Today, we welcome Edwin Scholars, Dr. Ann Holland, Joan Tiffany, Associate Professors of Nursing, Dr. Kathy Tilton, who we welcome back to Texas, um, and McCall Cleves, the um, student class of 2016 graduating in May. Okay, very good. As they present their research on student learning impact on patient centered care coordination clinic module. So, welcome and congratulations on the good. Are we on? Okay. Well, welcome and thank you so much for coming. This is very exciting that we have such an audience and we appreciate your interest. Um, I'm Ann Holland and my colleague Kathy Tilton, and McCall Cleave, and Joan Tiffany. And um, we are presenting today, as um, Deb said, about our Edwin Scholar Project. And um, our project was funded by the Edwin Scholars Award and also by a faculty alumni grant. Our objectives for today are listed clearly here. I'll read them very quickly. We're going to describe the curriculum module that helps students develop knowledge, skills, and attitudes in performing patient-centered care coordination activities, describe the research and design and methods that we used in this study, discuss our results, which we think is the best part, and if it increased student awareness of nursing care across studies, and to discuss um, the collaborative research experience, which was the richest. So the fact is that healthcare needs are changing. We're seeing an emphasis on the patient as the primary focus in nursing care, taking into consideration their desires and needs. As healthcare has become more fragmented and continues to increase in complexity as a result of various settings, patient-centered care coordination is essential content in both classroom didactic and practical application in developing the role of quick care coordinator throughout transitions of care. According to the Institute of Medicine, baccalaureate nursing education must increase its emphasis on the professional nursing role of care coordination in order to meet these changing healthcare needs. Only two studies examine the teaching of the concept of patient-centered care coordination. The results of our study demonstrate that an intentional curricular module can indeed develop students' knowledge, attitudes, and skills in what is becoming a core professional competency for nurses, ultimately facilitating more positive patient outcomes. We had already had several assignments that were integrated into the clinical course, and although they were meaningful assignments, we felt that they had greater potential for making an impact if the assignments were connected and maintained a singular focus. So therefore, we concentrated five assignments. You see four listed. We, we were challenged to get this learning experience to be impactful. And we had four, actually five different clinical experiences. Home care and hospice, some had two days of home care. Ambulatory care, virtual simulation, transitions of care, low fidelity, simulation and a community support group all focused on chronic illness that were part of a course but didn't have the same 
meaning and thread through them. You can go on. Through all of this, these clinical experiences were integrated into a, a part of a course that focuses on chronicity. So we maintained our focus on chronic mental and physical illness separately and the integration of both of them because we feel that they're rather inseparable yes. in many people. And we saw that in the clinical settings. A lot of us did. I'm looking at a lot of my students saying, yes, you can't separate them. So we were, we were um, conscious and, and gave good attention to keeping them together and focusing on the non-acute care environment where a lot of care for these patients actually occurs. So we did this um, modification of the curriculum um, to create this more cohesive half-semester clinical module that was focused on patient-centered care coordination within a larger clinical course. And so after we redesigned that curriculum, we um, decided to do a study to find out if that curricular module had an impact on student learning. So we um, conducted the study during the spring semester of the um, 2014, so spring semester 2014, so our current seniors, um, some of them were participants in the study. We invited all the junior level students um, to participate and um, 73 of them um, consented to participate. So we're really pleased with that um, percentage of participation. And then we collected data throughout the spring semester using three different data collection methods. And we also, in addition to those three methods, we created a um, demographic form. So we did have students um, report demographic information to us for the analysis. We used both quantitative and qualitative methods, which we will describe in future slides. Uh, we needed to maintain student participant confidentiality, so we created a coding scheme. We assigned a number to each participant, and so that um, we substituted the number for their name on any form that they filled out so that we were able to de-identify the data. Um, we were motivated to do this um, study by attendance at a keynote presentation at a national nursing education conference. Joan and I attended this conference um, in the spring of 2013. Oh, 14. 14. Two, spring of 2014. Yeah, we and we um, listened to a keynote presentation by Chris Tanner, who is an internationally known nurse educator and scholar. And she was challenging nurse educators to uh, really elevate the, the level of their scholarship in nursing education. Um, and she cited an evaluation framework um, that's been published by Kirkpatrick, Kirkpatrick and Kirkpatrick, where they identify four levels of um, evaluation. Um, the first one being reaction, which kind of translates into attitudes and satisfaction. Level two is learning, which is measurable cognitive learning. Level three is behavior, which is actual behavioral change. And then level four would be results, or in our case, it was the effect of student learning on patient outcomes, that real end goal. And what Tanner was saying is that much of nursing education research had been focusing at levels one and two. We were just kind of measuring student satisfaction or attitude change or measuring knowledge change. And she was you know, pushing us that we needed to start creating studies that focus on levels three and four, real behavior change. And so Joan and I were really motivated by that. And she actually, in her keynote address, talked about how we need to start focusing on patient-centered care coordination. And we came back excited because we knew we were already including some um, things in our curriculum that focused on that, but we kind of had this vision of how that could be better. So this framework did um, influence the um, data collection methods that we use, and we'll explain how. So one uh, method of data collection was focus groups. And um, we developed an eight-question semi-structured focus group discussion guide. And um, the um, questions, I'll just read a couple of them as an example. So one question was, describe an experience in one of the PCCC um, clinicals that most promoted your learning about the nurse's role in PCCC. 
I see some people nodding their heads if they remember these questions. <laughs> um, describe how your PCCC clinical experiences influenced your care of acute care patients during the semester. That was a question that we wrote to try to really get at behavior. They wanted them, we wanted them to actually talk about what did you do differently in your hospital clinicals because of what you learned in PCCC. And then another one was imagine yourself working as an RN in your first job. What behaviors will you be performing that contribute to PCCC in your patient population? So again, that we designed that question to be more at that level three um, behavior. So um, when students signed the consent form, they checked a box on that consent form if they were willing to participate in a focus group. And we had 23 of our 77 students volunteer to participate. And in the end, 16 of those actually were able to come to a focus group. And the focus group sizes ranged from one to four. So we had one focus group where only one student could come. But then we had um, two, three, and four at the other ones. And the good thing is we had equal numbers of participants in the first half of the semester following the first half module and the second half. Um, we then uh, sent, we re audio recorded the focus groups and we sent those off to a professional transcription com uh, company and they transcribed them for us so that we could use them for data analysis. So the qualitative data analysis was conducted, as Ann said, using the focus group transcripts. First, I compared the transcripts with the audio recordings to ensure accuracy and substituted alias names for each participant to de-identify the data. Anne and I then performed an iterative process of independent coding, followed by meeting to reach agreement on the level of analysis, reconcile the separate code lists, and mutually name codes. And we ended up having 20 final codes after the first transcript, and then only added five in transcripts two through six. Uh, which was nice to see because it reflected consistency of participant responses between the focus groups. Uh, we then collaboratively combined related codes to form themes, and there were four main themes, as you can see here. Uh, the role of the professional nurse, valuing the patient family experience, knowledge and skills that nurses need for PCCC, and challenges of the learning experience. After that, we independently highlighted key student statements from the final co codes to help support uh, our themes, and we ended up having a lot of the same quotes, that, so that just went to show um, the strength that supported our findings. Uh, we collaboratively produced a written narrative of the first theme, and from there I went ahead and drafted uh, written narratives of the second through the fourth theme. As part of our quantitative data, we used a tool called ICSI, we affectionately call it ICSI, the Interpersonal Communication Style Inventory, and it's a content validated evaluation tool with 37 items organized in six domains used to measure nurses' communication performance during a telephone conversation. The ICSI rater determines whether the participant performs each item and this instrument evaluates level three competencies or behavior on the Kirkpatrick and Kirkpatrick um, evaluation scale. The reliability of the tool was established by the developers with a Cronbach Alpha of um, score of 0.764. The intent of this data collection was to obtain baseline data regarding student performance in a clinically focused telephone conversation where advice would be provided to the patient by the student. I was able to um, rate all of these because I was the avatar patients for all the encounters for the telephone calls. And so we had real consistent data collection for this, so that worked really well, I think, and got some, noticed some interesting themes. And when we flip to the other side, it'll show us some of the things that we, we noticed. We know our nursing students at Bethel are very caring and concerned. And they were expression of care and concern, they rated really high. I felt actually cared for by many of them as the avatar patient, but seriously. It, it's amazing when you're in Second Life, what that does in virtual simulation. They were very clear on the information they provided. They didn't always provide the right information, but it was all the same. That's why we do simulation. This is why it's simulation. 
And, and what's unique about this is they're all alone. They don't have peers. No one's watching them in virtual simulation. They are just able to be a nurse. And it's really quite beautiful and moving sometimes. Confidence building. They were very, you can do this. You, very encouraging to the patients, or to me as the patients. Um, they, ended, they weren't as strong on individualization of care, but they still were above that 80% on all performers. Responsiveness and engagement of the caller and decisions were a little lower in these categories, and likely because our students did not receive any formal education about how to interact with patients, providing information in phone calls. That's not part of the curriculum. We wanted to obtain baseline data to see how do students do in this. Just throw it out there, see how they do. And that engagement, it's also probably the level of a junior nursing student, not so much of a partnership yet with their patients. But I was still pretty pleased with how they did. OK, so the third tool we used was the CSMSS. <laughs> <laughs> and it actually was a homegrown tool that um, Kathy designed for her uh, DNP for her doctoral work. And it's a seven item Likert scale and it measures confidence in providing chronic care management to patients. So we administered the pretest right before everybody, all the students took the pretest at the very beginning of the semester. And then half a semester was psych mental health clinical. Half of semester was the PCCCC, PCCC, and then we flipped. So we had half at each semester. And they took the post-test after they completed their PCCC. So part of, half of the class did it at the end of the first half of the semester, and then at the very end of the semester, the second group um, completed that. So here's our findings which is really interesting and very exciting. And when we had um, Joel Fredrickson help us with this data, and he sent back an email after we kind of ran the data first, and he said, this is a massive effect size. <laughs> and so we're like, sweet, it's, it's massive. <laughs> and so in research, that's a really good thing. <laughs> you want a massive effect size. And so um, if you go across from pre to post, here are the seven measures and then the mean for the pretest and the mean for the post test. And as you can see, um, there was a pretty good leap between those um, on a five scale, it was only five point scale. So um, the ones that were the highest were talking to a patient about chronic self, um, man, Ill illness self-management. That went from 2.66 to a post test of 4.12. So that was really good. They um, really increased their self-confidence with working with patients. And many of them said, just anecdotally, you know, I feel so much more comfortable working with patients now that I practiced, you know, talking to patients um, in the virtual world. Discussing lifestyle changes, that's, that's really, it's difficult for nurses who are practicing for a long time to discuss those changes. You know, you should really quit smoking. What's your diet like? You know, all those kind of, um, lifestyle kind of changes and so when you're especially when you're a junior student so that was huge too to see that confidence leap in that and then discussing our uh, predetermining um, patient need for self-management support so that was another one that was um, high and then when we compared the means here we had you can see the pretest mean was 20.315 the post-test was 28.39. So when we put that into the statistical management system, um, we ended up at a point, as you can see over here, it was off the scale. So we can say that at a .01 level, we're 99% confident, 99% of the time, this will happen, this happened because of the, the intervention rather than happening by chance. So um, that effect, that was that massive effect. The change in the means was statistically significant at that very high level. So that was, um, was really fun to see. And then our research results overall, um, kind of pulling it all together, all three of our measures, anecdotal conversations with students, faculty saying, boy, I can see a difference in my students. 
Um, the only thing we would like to do is somehow figure out how we can interview patients. <laughs> you know, how four. can we interview we patients to, to say, four. Yeah. yeah, that level four. So, you know, we're thinking. <laughs> but um, the curricular module positively impacted student learning outcomes, and they started to grasp that importance of communication. Huge in healthcare. 77% of the errors that happen in healthcare are communication related. Communication is huge, and so we really um, were pleased to see that. Students became more confident in communicating essential self-care concepts to patients and families. A lot of, you know, a lot of nursing is confidence. You know, going in there and looking like we know what we're doing, right? Um, we don't want nurses to come in and say, oh, well, let's see, what am I supposed to do here? Um, and then student behaviors in the acute care setting changed as a result of their PCCC clinical experiences, and that came out of the focus groups. So next steps. Um, we, one of the themes, uh, one of the four themes from the qualitative analysis was challenges in the learning experience, challenges of the learning experience. And, and students gave really good feedback about um, what those um, clinical experiences were what went well and what did not go so well and when we heard you know feedback through our course um, evaluation as well so both the focus group data anecdotal um, con conversations and then the course evaluation showed us that we had some improvements to make one of them was in the orientation to the PCCC clinical module the way we did it last year is um, the students during their first week of class um, in February had a whole day on campus clinical day where they were oriented to the mental health and the PCC experience. So we, we did a, um, a rather brief orientation to patient-centered care coordination as well as introducing the study and asking students to participate. And we heard very clearly that students didn't remember a thing. And so then that influenced their, their, what they got out of their experiences and um, how confident they felt about what they were supposed to do um, in these experiences. Because it's important to realize that this PCCC module requires a lot of independence on the part of the student. Okay? They don't have a faculty going with them and doing these things directly with them, they are kind of doing these, there's instructions, and they're going out to home care to meet a nurse they've never met before. They have to find a support group to attend. And so it requires a lot of independence. So the orientation didn't work. So for this spring, we're going to create a narrated PowerPoint, um, Educanon, <laughs> these guys know what that is. Um, and so that the students will be assigned to complete that immediately prior to their module, there will be some quiz questions built in so that we can know that they've done it, we can monitor that, they you know, can evaluate themselves about how they did on that, and they will complete it just in time, rather than having it way at the beginning of the semester for people that don't start this module till halfway through the semester. So we're hoping that improves the experience for students. The other major change that we needed to make was in the transitions of care assignment. Kathy mentioned earlier it was a very low fidelity um, um, kind of an assignment. And what we heard in the focus groups really clearly is that what really impacted student learning was experiences with patients. And that's not surprising to us. You know, I mean, we learn so much by applying and being with the patients. So we are going to um, enhance that assignment and create a more of a case study that students will, um, will read. And then we're going to create um, like some audio, little audio snippets that will thread throughout the assignment um, that would be, you know, voice of the voice of the patient, the voice of the nurse, the voice of the family members, you know, different people within the case study so that it becomes a little more real and is grounded in a patient experience. And we're hoping that will improve it. Uh, following data analysis, we collaborated to write a manuscript over the summer. We had regular meetings via Zoom. That's great. Um, 
and submitted uh, our manuscript to a leading nursing education journal in August. We received notice in September that our article was rejected. We were requested to okay. submit a research brief, but we had just had a research brief for another project done and we thought, you know, this really is meatier. We're going to be, um, we understand the reasons and they wanted a multi-site study primarily as, as well, not that ours didn't merit value, which you'll see in a minute that it did. But uh, we are going to submit to another one. So we're just, we decided not to opt for the research brief to that particular journal, but we go with another nursing journal first. And that submission process is in process. <laughs> it's in process. And that journal was, it's a really high level journal and they have really moved to multi-site studies because that's what they, you know, they're trying to kind of broaden their evidence. And, um, and we kind of knew that going we in, but we we thought, we're going to try. To so we try. There, but and since there's only two articles written about it, you know, we thought, oh, maybe they'll accept it because there isn't much literature out there about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so presentations. Mm -hmm. We um, actually just got, re, um, we just received notification from the Sigma Theta Tau International slash National League for Nursing Nurse Educator Research Conference in Washington, D.C. in April. We submitted a symposium that has three parts to it, and we were just accepted for that. So that will be really fun, and McCall's going to come with us as well. So that will be um, a really it's a, a great conference. Um, it, this is, that's, the, that's the conference that Joan and I were attending two years ago where we heard the keynote address that motivated the study. So, so we're hoping to motivate to others with our yeah. Yeah. with our presentation. And then we got accepted for a poster presentation in Florida in March and we're trying to decide if if um so gonna do Florida March I know it's either during spring break. No, you can come see me. It's during spring break. <laughs> So as a student who went through this curricular module, I was able to understand the perspective of the participants. Having first-hand involvement and peer interaction created a unique aspect of the qualitative research process. In collaborating with the team, I was able to verbalize understanding and agreement with the findings while remaining unbiased as I excluded myself from the focus group experience. Being a part of this research team has opened my eyes to the strengths that collaboration introduces. We all worked on our specific portions of the manuscript, but came together throughout the entire process, providing feedback and suggestions to one another. As Deb had hit on earlier, um, something that I really valued throughout all of this was that the professors treated me as an equal member of the team, allowing me to explore the literature which was used as a foundation to support the growing evidence base for teaching care coordination and transitions of care in nursing education. I also added to the manuscript by contributing to the written narratives of each theme with the guidance and support of the faculty. So they just helped include me throughout the entire process. And our kind of system of meetings started out primarily with uh, meeting at Bethel, just establishing our plan and a timeline of how we were going to go about everything. And then throughout the summer, we would have, as Kathy mentioned, uhu video chats about every week and a half, two weeks or so. And then um, throughout that time between our meetings, we would do our work on a Google Doc, which allowed us to make comments and edits. Um, so very helpful throughout the entire process. Uh, I worked closely with Anne on the qualitative research, and then we came together with Joan and Kathy and their quantitative findings. So discussing the results from the two different uh, aspects helped confirm and solidify both perspectives. But for me, the most significant impact of conducting research with others was being able to have insight from various aspects and applying that to the communication of our findings. Getting input from three other people involved with different parts of the study brought new ideas and created a more cohesive final manuscript. Questions? No? 
those of you who participated in the module, are you excited about the results? Yeah. <laughs> so I wondered if you saw a difference in your results. You had to have to move oh, oh, I forgot to mention oh, that. students doing it first and second and then Joe We ran talking. those statistics mm -hmm. to, so we, we compared the means of the first half and the second half. Yeah. Very excellent question. Yes. And there was no statistically significant difference. So that, Joel said, then that really shows us that it was the intervention, not the length of the semester. Right. So, yeah, good. Could, could the standard deviations remain the same? Very close. There was no statistical nope. significant difference. That, and we were really excited about that. There certainly would have been the possibility that the students in the second half would have done better because they had more clinical, more experience, other learning experiences. And it was remarkable to see there was no statistically significant difference. So that means the PCCC module had the same effect whether you took it first half or second half. On the ICSI, there was a little bit of difference as I was collecting data the second half. You can see second half burnout in the students in the <laughs> simulation. And that last week, that last group, I thought, or they just want to get this done and get out of here. <laughs> that was so palpable, even being like across town as an avatar. And <laughs> you could feel it. And I was really concerned that the data would show that they performed significantly lower. And on some items, maybe that second half we looked at it, was but it, it wasn't enough to be reportable, and it wasn't a significant contribution to any of the data analysis. So, but I could definitely tell in them a difference that last group that went through the ambulatory virtual sim, um, having done all the others. Yes. Was there any way I know? Um, of course, you had to do like 80 of them, so you were probably tired, tired of them. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's just following it up. But was there any way to like make sure that the experiences were within a certain amount of sameness? Oh, I yes. know like Hannah and I had both done ours, and when we talked about it, like she had some questions that I did not, and I had questions mm -hmm. she It did. depends on where the student took the conversation, the right. patient responded in the direction of the student, so they weren't programmed. I was the patient on a different day, and you know your patients are not the same hour to hour, much less day to day. So, so she followed where right. you took her. Right, where you guided the conversation. I allowed the student to pretty much direct it, and I had certain goals that I wanted to get from you as responses when I was talking to the patients, but they were not prescriptive. It's more of the characteristics of your communication and your ability to communicate that was the focus of the data collection. Yeah, we weren't looking at specific, they said this, they said this. We were looking at more broad. Like checking your glucose every pre-meal. That uh, Those things weren't criteria we were measuring. It was about more ability to communicate. And kind of and on your feet. And understand what the patient needed, particularly, yeah. I will just I will just second what McCall said about our collaborative process. It was a remarkable team, and um, it, even though we were not meeting together frequently, we worked so effectively together, and the online tools worked very well. McCall and I met more frequently because we, we were doing the qualitative analysis together. So we did meet several times, just the two of us, because of that analytic process. Um, and but Kathy and I met separately on the quantitative yes. as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which was neat to come together after. And then we all came together right. and we're like, we, right. thought we were so <laughs> excited. Yeah. I had to share the massive effect side of email. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, McCall did a truly remarkable Absolutely. job. She was yeah. a scholar <laughs> in every sense. Her writing either. Oh, it was awesome. Amazing. Yeah. And she she really did write a significant portion of our manuscript. I mean, this was not just a little add on. McCall was a full participant in the entire thing. So we all are praying that she, like, decides research is <laughs> interesting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Thanks for coming. Thank you so much Thank for you. coming.